Okay, so you can do whatever you want, David, for the next okay, 16 uh, minutes. Okay, 16 minutes. Yeah, you get okay. 16 minutes. Okay. Uh, all it takes, I think, is this very uh, minimal ethical commitment to phase out in involuntary suffering. So no one need uh, feel they need to sign up to utilitarian ethics to support the abolitionist project. But why did you pick utilitarianism as your favorite flavor of philosophy? What was it that attracted you? What was it for you that grabbed you, inspired you perhaps? Mm. I think it's the it's the combination of of compassion uh, and rationality. What that would now be called rational altruism. Uh, clearly, my own uh, uh, suffering and those uh, uh, the suffering of those I loved and care about loomed large in my life. But I also took very seriously from science the the the, the, the so called view from nowhere. The idea that uh, uh, it, it is completely an illusion that one is the uh, the center of the universe, and if my suffering is is bad for me, I infer that suffering anywhere for anyone is bad. Uh, and uh, yes, ra- uh, utilitarianism in that sense is is systematized compassion. Mm-hmm. And where does veganism fit into the picture, and how? Mm-hmm. Um, it's back to the uh, 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 the, rash- the, the rationality again. Uh, it's very natural to contrast uh, humans uh, and non-human animals in the way it was once very natural to uh, contrast white uh, Christian gentlemen with, uh, with with primitive savages. Uh, but all the evidence, convergence of evidence from neuroscience evolutionary biology and neurophysiology suggests that non-human animals the ones you know the pigs and so on are as as as, as sentient and as sapient as pre-linguistic uh toddlers uh and we treat non-human animals in the way that if if a human were to treat a pre-linguistic toddler in the way we treat pigs for instance that that the perpetrator would be locked up for life mm-hmm. uh and it is in that sense, is I won't argue here for anyone who says, uh, let's say, a moral anti-realist who says there's nothing wrong with abusing or, or, or killing toddlers. But assuming we take that as read that it is profoundly abhorrent to, to harm human toddlers, I would say it is profoundly abhorrent to uh, to, to harm non-human animals. Uh, instead of harming them and exploiting them, uh, we should be thinking of ways to help and look after them. So at what point in your life did you start thinking about uh, being becoming a vegan? And, and why? Was there a particular event that triggered that line of thinking? Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm a third-generation vegetarian. Grandparents on both sides were vegetarian, which is probably... Wow. Uh, unique uh, to the uh, the West, but this is a, an accident of birth rather than the signature of uh, of great uh, virtue uh, on my part. Um, but yes, clearly that uh, uh, background, my parents uh, uh, were uh, 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 Christians, I should add, uh, must have contributed to my early development. One of my earliest memories was trying to uh, uh, rescue uh, little ants that uh, small, cruel, small boys had. Uh, had trodden on uh, that must have been about the age of four or five um, but uh, uh, so yes I said it's very difficult clearly to understand fully one's own intellectual antecedents but that clearly was a contributing factor mm-hmm. so you've been a vegan since birth oh no I've been a, uh, I was a vegetarian since birth uh, vegan much more recently about seven or eight years ago um, so you've never had meat in your life no, I, I would not recognize the taste of meat, no. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. So, now, you were talking about the the fact that pre-linguistic toddlers uh, probably exhibit the same level of sentience such as, say, adult pigs, uh, which we slaughter for food on our, you know, industrial scale. Uh, can you define your threshold for sentience and how do you measure it? Um, it is clearly harder to give an accurate 
quantitative measure of, uh, for instance, suffering in pre-linguistic humans and non-human animals. But what one can do is operationalize the notion and, and uh, investigate how hard either a, a human or a non-human animal will work to obtain or avoid a particular stimulus. So in that sense, it's possible to uh, uh, quantify pleasure and pain also, one can uh, in investigate this down to the molecular uh, level. There are, and to take one example, there is a particular uh, gene, the SCN9A gene. Nonsense mutations induce complete insensitivity to pain. Other mutations uh, induce either a very high or a very low pain threshold. And so, yes, one can investigate, and if one looks at pigs and uh, toddlers, one finds that the molecular pathways and the genes and the gene expression profi profiles implicated in, our, uh, in pain, pleasure, and, the raw, and our raw emotions uh, are almost identical. What distinguishes uh, humans uh, uh, from non-human animals is, in many cases, extraordinarily uh, 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 subtle at the genetic and molecular level. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that that huge genetic overlap would be sufficient to translate into sentience proper? Uh, one can't defeat radical skepticism. I mean, the only person one will ever know for sure uh, uh, is, is conscious is oneself. But it, it seems a reasonable inference to the best explanation to assume this. After all, science is based uh, on the principle of the uniformity of nature. Mm-hmm. I infer that you feel profound distress because if you catch your hand in the door, uh, uh, your behavior is similar to that of me or a pig. The molecular processes at work in your mind brain uh, seem to be nearly identical. What distinguishes you or, or me from the pig, or for that matter, the pre-linguistic toddler, a uh, number of things, but in particular, it's, uh, uh, the, it's our capacity for generative syntax. Uh, uh, and there's very little evidence that this capacity for generative syntax uh, is bound up with degree of sentience. After all, if you ask me how was it that I produced the sentence I'm doing now, which no one has ever uttered in the history of the world before, it's opaque to introspection. Uh, it's, <laughs> very, very, it's very, very subtle and elusive, the ph phenomenology of thought. I think most of us have this implicitly this idea of the great chain of being with humans more intensely conscious than, than, than any other creature. But if you actually look at consciousness, uh, it's the most primitive forms, pain, uh, uh, fear, disgust, and so on, that are the most intense, whereas the most uh, cerebral, you know, ability to solve differential equations or, or generate complex sent uh, uh, sentences are actually the thinnest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my uh, audience member asks this, is there such a thing as vegan since we are ingesting so much bacteria every minute? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the critical distinction is that uh, bacteria are, to the best of our knowledge, not subjects uh, of experience. And I think what... Uh, uh, so in that sense, I don't think one needs to worry about the ethical status of bacteria, of, of, of lettuces, or, and much more controversially, uh, I, I don't think a digital computer is a subject of experience either. Um, but uh, yes, it's not a matter of, of, of personal purity. Uh, it, it, it's a matter of not ha causing harm to fellow subjects of experience. Have a, uh, We're going to come back to the question of computers, but let me let me move up the ladder here and ask you: How about fish? Uh, if you look at, for example, the molecular substrates of, of of panic and terror and pain in a fish, they are extraordinarily similar to that of a human being. Now, it seems unlikely that. Uh, uh, that fish, for instance, have some metacognitive capacity for reflective self-awareness. But on the other hand, if you're in a state of uh, blind terror or panic or, or agony, neither do you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what about in vitro meat? Would you, would you, I mean, it probably shouldn't even be called meat because it's in vitro. Mm -hmm. uh, would you consider that 
a potential for your vegetarian diet? Um, though personally I have no craving for meat, uh, I am extremely enthusiastic about the potentiality uh, of in vitro meat because unfortunately there is no argument against moral apathy. Um, uh, one can argue to one's blue in the face, but in the end, at the end of the day many people will uh, just shrug their shoulders and say, but I like the taste of meat. Um, now, one wouldn't consider this uh, uh, a satisfactory rationalization of child abuse, whether it should be considered a, a, a satisfactory rationalization of animal abuse is another question. But if we are really to have global veganism or in vitrotarianism, I think it is essential to uh, further develop and commercialize in vitro meat. Uh, and one definition of transhumanism, if, if, if you like, is technical solution to ethical problems. Now, uh, I suspect you might be skeptical that most people would be prepared to make uh, the transition to something as unnatural as in vitro meat. But recall it's not or it needn't be genetically engineered. Uh, and in many ways, it's inverted commas more natural uh, than today's factory farmed uh, pr products from, from live animals. So, yes, I think there is going to be an in vitro meat uh, revolution. And once, for the most part, we have uh, made the transition, I think uh, our grandchildren are going to be appalled and incredulous that we could have treated sentient beings in the way we did. Mm -hmm. But would you consider consuming it yourself? I would have absolutely no ethical problems, whether at a purely cul culinary level I would like it, I don't know. I would have no ethical qualms about uh, so trying So you're open it. to trying it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the most common uh, uh, inquiry at, uh, at New Harvest, uh, which pioneered uh, research uh, into in vitro meat, believe it or not, is people inquiring whether it will be possible to prepare human flesh in this way. So uh, although it, uh, cannibalism wouldn't personally be to my taste, I, I don't have uh, any qualms other than aesthetic qualms for people who want to try it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David, you are the co-founder of the World's Transhumanist Association. So let me ask you, uh, you just said that I was going to ask you to define transhumanism for us. So do you want to stick with transhumanism is a technical solution for ethical problems? Is that um, the best definition? <laughs> I, I suppose a, a standard one-sentence uh, definition uh, would involve the use of technology to overcome our biological limitations. And I think it's very useful just as a mnemonic to have, if you like, the, th the three S's. Uh, uh, transhumanists believe in, uh, in super intelligence, super longevity, and my particular focus, uh, super happiness, super, super well-being. Uh, uh, once again, any little slogan like that is going to be a gross simplification. Uh, but uh, yes, it's a, perhaps a useful mnemonic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It it kind of sounds to me almost like supermanism, super everything. <laughs> a lot of supers, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> super longevity, super, you know, intelligence, etc. Uh, now, is it fair to say that mainstream philosophy has largely ignored transhumanism for the past thirty years or so? Uh, yes, I think that is uh, uh, quite a fair description. I, I, I won't attempt to give a lightning synopsis of the history of uh, analytic philosophy for the past 30, 30 odd years or so. Well, I can if you uh, can if you want. Um, but uh, yes, uh, transhumanist themes have not been central uh, to mainstream philosophy. Why um, do you think that's the case? Hi. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Part of the reason, I think, is that in the second half of the 20th century, mainstream academic analytic philosophy became quite estranged uh, from developments uh, in science, uh, partly under the influence of the later Wittgenstein and uh, the Oxford School of Philosophy. Uh, and this is slowly changing, but, but only uh, uh, slowly changing. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, Nick, Nick Bostrom, whom I 
co-founded the World Transhumanist Association with, as you know, is now uh, a professor in Oxford, which uh, 20 years ago uh, would be absolutely absolutely unthinkable. Uh, the home of ordinary language philosophy uh, now has a future a future of humanity institute. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, do you think we're making ground here? Yes, I I I think so. Uh, but uh, inevitably, uh, uh, progress is slow. <laughs> What do you say to people who say that transhumanism is kind of very British and libertarian in character? I mean, uh, Nick Bostrom, yourself, Max Moore, for example, some of the most notable figures in transhumanism nowadays are all British and uh, allegedly libertarian. Um, Max Moore would certainly fall under the category of the libertarian wing. I'm uh, very much on the the, uh, the the dripping left liberal wing, shall we say, of <laughs> of, 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 of of transhumanism. Um, yes, I, I think if if I ha uh, let's say was uh, uh, born in the uh, Soviet Union, old Soviet Union, for instance, I might have a very different perspective. But my gut instincts. Uh, are those of the left. As I said, gut instincts, uh, it's not uh, generally very fruitful to draw this simple uh, left-right uh, uh, line, but, uh, but transhumanism spans the traditional left-right uh, uh, divide. But the, So if we can call it at all, the British school is kind of predominant, if you will, is that... I would, if if you look at the the state of of, of contemporary transhumanism, um, sing, singularitarianism, for instance, rather the Kurzweilian variety mm -hmm. or the uh, or the Miri variety, uh, is not distinctively British. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, who has done more than anyone else to to rescue uh, super longevity from yep. a crank from crank alley to serious science, yes, he is. Uh, 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 British and uh, yes, as you can probably tell from my accent, I, I'm I'm a Brit myself. <laughs> but uh, uh, I wouldn't describe transhumanism as a distinctly uh, British phenom uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly has a strong Anglo-American influence. But so, uh, David, are you? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> there you are. Good. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we, we may require some audio uh, level, I guess, uh, re rearranging, uh, but uh, otherwise we, we should be pretty ready for student questions. How ready the students are to ask questions is kind of an, an individual matter, but there must be some of you just bursting to look David Pierce in the eye and ask him some Question. So you need to come forward and, and use this microphone. Yep, okay. <laughs> so we have a first volunteer here. Yeah, so just stand where I was standing and face the screen so that you can see yourself. In that okay, window. all right. This is, this is all good. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine, crystal clear. And by the way, I don't know where you're broadcasting from. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I've never done anything like this before. So, uh, all right, so I had a few questions. I guess I'll keep it short because I know other people are going to ask stuff. Um, I watched one of your other interviews uh, before this, and I was wondering, uh, you know, if let's say 500 years down the line, all all you know, pain, suffering, it's all abolished. Um, w what would you think would come after that? Because if everything is all seems to be solved, it's, I just sort of think like, w what do we have left to do? I guess maybe explore space. That's all I can really think of. <laughs> uh Though uh, at times I might sound as though the only thing uh, that matters is suffering and get rid, rid of suffering, um, the effects of recalibrating the hedonic treadmill uh, is to leave intact uh, most, if not all, of your existing goals and ambitions. So sure, if we were talking about here getting blissed out, some uniform level of well-being, 
what else would, the, would there be to do? If, on the other hand, the focus is on information sensitive, uh, information sensitive gradients of well-being, uh, there will be at least as many challenges. Uh, indeed, other things being equal, given the strong positive correlation between enhanced well-being and enhanced motivation, it may well be uh, that our uh, descendants will actually be hyper-motivated by today's standards. Um, why don't I go into more detail about what life will be like 300, 500 years hence, uh, essentially because it would be fanciful to do so. I don't, nothing to stop one, one, one speculating. Um, however, uh, yes, the specific uh, prediction that, yes, the world's last unpleasant experience in our forward light cone will be a precisely a date, date, uh, dateable event sometime in the next few hundred years. Very tentative, but I do hold hold to that. But that I wouldn't say it's the end of history so much as the yeah the start of a new era. Um, that makes uh, yeah that makes sense. Uh, okay, I've got another question, and I'm sh I'm sure you've probably heard all of these things before. Um, one of the concerns I think that a lot of people have with emerging technologies is that they they wouldn't be, I guess, uh, divided or spread within a population equally. And so if you have something like genetics where you're able to modify people's genes and, you know, before birth and, and change these things, one of the concerns is that, well, maybe only the wealthy would be able to afford it or certain, certain groups would be able to afford it. So I was wondering what you thought about that. Yes, this is a very real concern, but uh, a couple of points in response. First, if you consider, for instance, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis by arranging not to have a child uh, with cystic fibrosis, you save the health services immense sums of money. And though I hate to reduce something like depression to uh, the economics of depression, nonetheless, uh, depressive disorder, subclinical depression, full-blown depression uh, cost, it, uh, cost the economy hundreds of hundreds of billions uh, a, a year worldwide. Uh, so it will be extremely cost-effective to uh, weed out the genes predisposing to depressive disorder and, of course, the well-known genetic diseases. Um, the other point to make is that the cost of any information-based technology tends to zero. Even in a, a, an era of unlimited material abundance, there can never be unlimited status goods or positional goods. But when it comes to uh, unraveling the genetic code, the cost of personal genome sequencing, the cost of pre-implantation diagnosis screening like that, uh, the cost will rapidly become trivial. So in that sense, I don't think cost is going to be a decisive issue. Okay. Uh, yeah, does anybody else have any other? I've got more questions, but I don't want to. Yeah, sure, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's another student approaching. This, you know, there's so much uh, accidental uh, character of, of this, but the quality of... Uh, you know, the audio and video is really quite good, so, so, I, so, I, so I hope it is at your end, but it, but it certainly is here. Hi there. Hi. Okay, um, okay so I'll just start off with uh, one question based off um, a quote I read about you, saying how um, the world's last averse experience will be a precisely datable event. I was wondering if you can kind of explain how we could have that ability to predict the date of it. Um, well, there's one sense in which it's, it, 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 that's a, a trivial remark, i.e. if it could be sort of approaching the heat death of the universe or something, that would be the world's last aversive event. But I was meaning it much more specifically sometime within the next uh, uh, a few centuries. Um, but yes, once one actually ha has unraveled the precise molecular signature of unpleasant experience, then if one abolishes that molecular uh, signature, then unpleasant experience of any kind becomes physically impossible. Now, intuitively, one might feel that uh, given the number of things that we find distressing, and one can, for instance, find distressing the possibility, I don't know, that the United States might default on its debts or the war in Syria, or essentially uh, hundreds 
thousands, millions of, of different things. The idea that one could phase out all aversive experience uh, is on the face of it preposterous. Um, but if you actually look at the, uh, the basis of our core emotions of pain, pleasure, fear, uh, they're actually uh, yeah, deep within the heart of the limbic system and projections from the limbic system into uh, uh, to the neocortex enable us to have these fabulously uh, complex representations on which we can paint this uh, 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 nice or nasty hedonic tone. Um, and yes, starting with humans, recalibrating the hedonic uh, treadmill, uh, redesigning, editing our uh, ugly genetic source code. In principle, as I said, we could actually phase out suffering in humans and then go on within our wildlife parks uh, to apply the same principles of the welfare state, if you like, uh, starting off with higher, higher long-lived vertebrates, but ultimately down to uh, small rodents and deep within the oceans with the use of nanotechnology. Uh, now, in the case of large long-lived vertebrates, it would be possible to, uh, to do this kind of, uh, uh, yes, uh, a welfareism, if you like now. Free living elephants could be uh, microchipped, uh, late life orthodontic care, the rest of it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the deep oceans is currently beyond us, but recognizable extensions of existing technology, uh, yes, can edit uh, the this, this genetic source code, not just of humans, but all other species too. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I have one more question. Um, it's based on the idea of uh, you being a vegan and vegetarian. Um, I've just started to become a, I've been a vegetarian for about two months now, and I've just been thinking about different reasons and people doing so. And you mentioned how um, when people stop eating meat, like that goes towards the hedonistic of ruining, of, uh, abolishing animal cruelty. Um, would you say at all there's any relation in terms of, um, on a different level of the animal cruelty and people eating that meat that reflect their behavior in a contrary ambition to hedonistic motives? Would you say there's any kind of, like if someone eats meat, um, that's animal cruelty, but is it also contrary to hedonism in any other way? Uh, I suppose when most people in our society eat meat, for the most part, they are simply uh, oblivious of its origins. The meat industry goes to enormous lengths to disguise the nature of factory farming, uh, slaughterhouses behind glass walls. So it's not as though people, for the most part, who eat meat are malign. It, it, essentially, it's a matter of of, of not thinking about the story behind what's on their plates. And as far as they do at all, they're probably thinking that factory farming, well, it's probably a bit crowded. Uh, and slaughterhouses, they're probably thinking of, uh, you know, the kindly vet who put Rover to sleep. Uh, they're, they're not thinking of the suffering that lies behind it. Uh, so, um, yeah, OK, I'm making sweeping generalizations here, but that's my guess. I guess kind of what I was... Uh, also looking for is, uh, this is sort of my belief, but it's more of a spiritual sense that the kind of cruelty and the method and, and when you have the knowledge of how mass meat is made and consuming that kind of almost creates some sort of negativity or some sort of a like anti-hedonistic kind of property within a person. I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but it's just a thought I've been having. In, in, in some people, yes. But others, I would just, for, at least from my experience, they're just completely oblivious. They, they just do not think about it. And this is why it's so hard, perhaps, to believe that as a civilization we are doing something fundamentally monstrous because the people one knows who eat meat, you know, they, they, don't, they don't go around sort of waving uh, uh, swastikas. For the most part, they're kind, uh, uh, civ civilized people. Uh, uh, so, yes, there is this kind of conceptual gulf between, or at least this, this gulf in intuitions between at least what I believe intellectually, i.e. what we're doing is, is a crime against sentience, uh, and what one witnesses from one's circle of, uh, of, of colleagues, friends and acquaintances, some of whom still eat meat, yes. It's, it's a, a disconnect. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, other questions? Uh, Jason?
I have a couple questions for you. Uh, the first one is in, result, in regards to transhumanism and other cultures. You were talking about the British version and the American version. Are there other cultures that are veering towards this and which one would be able to accept transhumanism with the least disruption? My impression, and this is uh, yeah, purely impressionistic, this is not a, a scientific, rigorous, quantified or anything like this, is that the Scandinavian countries are uh, very rational, sensible, level-headed, they will weigh the arguments, uh, uh, they, well, they will listen uh, respectfully, but then critically make questions, and then once again, uh, okay, this is an incredibly crude way of putting it, but Sweden, Norway, I would say, uh, Finland too, uh, Denmark, uh, yes, I would say that the transhumanist movement here is uh, is, is, is is healthy, yes. Perfect. Uh, the next one is a little bit more on the well, imaginary side of things. Should we achieve transhumanism? What is our ethical and moral obligation to bring the other sentient beings, as you're defining them, along with us? Should we be you know, given this ability to, like the whales or the dolphins? And mm -hmm. and the I suppose here we get into question, difficult metaphysical questions about the nature of uh, personal identity and when one starts uh, genetically modifying or uh, prostheses and so on, non-human animals, in what sense are they the same kinds of beings they were before? Uh, some people would regard it as a betrayal of species essence. Now, in the case of today's obligate carnivores, I think insofar as we want to conserve these so-called, uh, yes, uh, these familiar, uh, these, the, the, these familiar creatures like lions and tigers, charismatic megafauna, as they've been called, then it is incumbent on us to genetically and behaviorally tweak them. But in terms of raising them to the level of human and then post-human superintelligence and super sentience, um, here I'm, uh, here I'm less clear. I think once one has uh, phased out the biology of involuntary suffering, the fact that another sentient being is cognitively humble is not of itself uh, somehow uh, morally offensive. Um, but uh, yes, I wouldn't like to be dogmatic here. So much depends on what your particular a value scheme is whether you're a kind of classical utilitarian, negative utilitarian, preference utilitarian, deontologist. Wherever possible on these issues, I try uh, to be as inclusive as possible. As soon as you tell people, for instance, that you're a negative utilitarian, they're likely to switch off, at least, at least in many cases. Whereas the kinds of scenario that transhumanists describe, uh, the super happiness, super longevity, super intelligence, they're consistent with uh, a great diversity of ethical views, um, clearly not the more radical forms of, of bioconservatism bio or any philosophy that revels in, uh, in pain or suffering or, or anything like this. Um, but yeah, no one who uh, decides to become a, a transhumanist need that they feel they, they, they should need to become a, a utilitarian, for instance. Mm. Very much. <laughs> So, other questions? Yeah. No, no, that, that's fine, really. You, you, you won't uh, engender hostile feelings amongst the other students. It gives them more, more time to prepare their own questions. It's quite a remarkable uh, opportunity that we have here, so we might as well make use of it. All right. Hi again. Uh, hi. Okay. So I've got a I've got a few more questions. Uh, one of, actually no. One of them was just a statement. I don't know if you're aware that I'm pretty sure they they debuted the first uh, first consumption of an in, in vitro burger. I think it was on breakfast television in the states somewhere. It might have been a few weeks ago. But uh, I I don't know if you knew about that. But I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, 
Anyways, uh, okay, one of my questions. Uh, I can't really conceive of a world without at least some sort of physical pain. And I know that you've mentioned before that you, know, you, can, you can change the threshold, uh, and I guess eventually you might want there to be no physical pain so that nobody gets hurt at all, but uh, I, I don't know. I always assume that there's always going to be a chair leg to sort of stub your toe on, uh, and that maybe it is useful to know when you stub your toe or do these other things because then you would want to, you know, fix your bones, uh, get, get things mended. <laughs> um, I think the first priority is to diminish the intensity of pain and therefore that when choosing the genetic breakup of one's future offspring, I think it was mentioned in the video clip, the SCN9A gene, it's only a, a one of a number of gene that's, genes that modulates pain sensitivity. And simply by giving your uh, future child a high pain threshold, um, is such that perhaps you know, the top sort of one or two percent of people today have, they, they, they don't suffer from congenital analgesia, but for, for, for the most part for them, pain is, yes, it, it, it's a very useful signaling mechanism. And that is the, that is the first stage. As to actually completely abolishing any form of unpleasant experience below hedonic zero when it comes to noxious stimuli, as I said, not so urgent, but I think it's feasible. I think there are, there are essentially two options. Um, one is, and if you'll pardon me for being uh, indelicate, imagine two people making love. Uh, the entire process is uh, generically pleasurable throughout, but nonetheless, uh, sensitive lovers are responsive to neg negative feedback. Some some aspects of love making are even more uh, uh, pleasant than others, shall we say? Uh, and in principle, one could one could imagine something like this even for noxious stimuli. But that's speculative. The alternative is to offload the function of nociception uh, onto smart prostheses, such as uh, when one is about to put one's hand inadvertently on a hot stove, prosthesis ensures that one's hand is taken away, presumably with a, a manual override, so one doesn't feel one has lost control over one's body. Now, it's just critical to uh, distinguish between nociception of uh, avoiding noxious uh, stimuli and the actual nasty raw feels of physical pain. As we know, they're, they're doubly dissociable, uh, e e even in humans. Um, in the case of our silicon, etc., robots, uh, to the best of our knowledge, it would not uh, enhance their capacity to respond to noxious stimuli if one painted on these, these terrible raw phenomenal feels. Uh, and clearly, in the case of organic robots like us, one doesn't want to abolish the wonderful and sublime things in life, but let's uh, let's abolish the phenomenology of the nasty things while retaining uh, the functional analogs if needed. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I've got another question about uh, analogs you mentioned of uh, negative emotions. So the need for to keep fear and disgust and all these other emotions that we generally don't like. And I thought I was just wondering if you could clarify what you meant about analogs, because uh, I, I didn't know what you meant if if we would still be feeling these emotions or if just some sort of sensor pops up and says you should feel fear now and you know get out of there or something. Well, yes, in theory, one could offload the negative side completely onto these smart prostheses. I'm assuming here that uh, existing uh, silicon robots, are, etc., are, are, are not uh, subjects of experience with a nasty phenomenology. Perhaps some people would, would contest it, but assuming this isn't the case, then that's one option. However, one doesn't need to go down that route. Simply any form of hedonic dip. Uh, even if uh, our hedonic set point, our hedonic range from the hedonic ceiling to the hedonic floor and the typical hedonic set point, even if it's orders of magnitude uh, higher and richer than today, so long as there is this information sensitive gradient uh, experience that is merely wonderful rather than sublime has this has this warning role, not in a in, in, in a. In a terror, not not in a terrible sense. Just as if one is 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 playing a game of computer chess or something. It's not as though one actively welcomes the uh, the threat to one's queen or something. But it doesn't 
plunge one into a state of anxiety or depression, or it certain, certainly needn't. Um, so yes, it is, it is critical to ret- retaining uh, critical insight to intellectual progress to conserve information sensitive gradients. That's that that that's the critical that's the critical thing. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, I guess uh, open it up again. So uh, maybe <clears throat> while we're waiting for the next uh, student, I, it. I've understood from your previous uh, teaching sessions that there's a strange uh, irony here in that what you describe, we actually know how to do pretty much today, whereas a lot of the other things we talk about in this course are you know, speculative and we don't really know what we're talking about, we don't really know how to do them. On the other hand, uh, biology is sufficiently slow, inherently slow, that it's likely that other things will supersede this, that we may plan to genetically engineer our children, but the technological singularity and other things may interrupt that process, so we may actually never uh, get there. So do you want to say a few, have have I sort of put it right, Is, is that how you see it too? that we're kind of ready to do this, but it's a slow process with many steps, and other things could conceivably interrupt it. Yes. I, many transhumanists are not especially focused on the coming reproductive revolution, designer babies, and the possible long-term selective uh, uh, pressure as we start uh, re-engineering the genome. Um, because they anticipate uh, a technological singularity, either in the uh, the Kurzweilian mode, in which we essentially mute, uh, merge with our machines, uh, mind uploading, in which you are uh, sca- uh, uh, scanned, digitized, and uploaded to a different uh, substrate, digital nirvana, or alternatively, uh, the uh, the Miri scenario, uh, where uh, Miri regarded it as much more likely that some uh, kind of uh, singleton AGI would effectively supersede uh, humanity, and this is uh, a core part of their mission to uh, uh, to alert humanity to the de- the danger uh, ahead of non friendly or, or, or unfriendly art- artificial general intelligence. Um, now. I confess I'm much, much more skeptical about this uh, technological singularity than many of my colleagues. I don't, for instance, think that a classical digital computer is ever going to be a a subject of experience as support interest in Qualia. Uh, A a classical digital computer, however smart and multifunctional, is never going to be able to uh, explore altered states of consciousness, psychedelia, to explore the neural correlates of uh, consciousness, or or, um, yes, or or, or do anything like that. Um, So, uh, yes, uh, I'm much more cautious than some of my transhumanist colleagues about where uh, classical digital computers are going. Right. But you do accept that there's a small chance that something like what Kurzweil has been talking about could occur in, you know, 2045, and that might really mess up the plans for these slower uh, biological uh, improvements. And... uh, 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 humanity might not count for much if the beings in control of the world are sentient uh, machines thousands of times smarter than we are, um, then, you know, reducing pain and suffering seems like a small part of a very much larger problem that mankind and womankind would, would have at that point. Yeah, I mean, the smarter and more sophisticated our AI, the more, in principle, we can use it to enhance ourselves and it as uh, recursively self-edit our own genetic uh, code and our uh, our neural wetware. So, uh, yes, it's uh, I, I I think it's there will be some degree I think 
of symbiosis. But a uh, complete fusion, I'm much more more skeptical. I mean, are we are we assuming, and this is what often is assumed, that uh, somehow, sometime, when it's unspecified, that classical digital computers are suddenly going to wake up, uh, become subjects of experience, to inquire, uh, to acquire something akin to a unitary self or, or something like this. The mechanism is unexplained. Um, it, 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 it depends upon how you look at things. You know, in this teaching room, we have doors in the back that automatically close. And it's a bit of a mystery exactly how that happens. And every now and then it happens when you don't expect it. But it's such a stupidly, you know, simple thing that e even though we don't quite 100% understand always why it's doing what it's doing, it doesn't frighten us very much. If it was something more complex than the door closing back there, it might worry us. Um, yeah, so, uh, Jason, do you want to ask? Hello again. Hi. So my questions are mostly around the changing state. So when you're, the questions of who gets to have it first, we already just talked about. But I'm looking at more of the, the diversity of what we have. So we do have, in the Western world, the ability to take care of people with Down syndrome. They give <laughs> back to us, people that are living lives that are incredibly innocent. So weeding out this kind of unique experiences where we're going into a homogeneous existence is something that I'm finding a little bit off-putting, to say the least. <laughs> how, do we, how do we keep our individuality? How do we keep our diversity on this transference? Yes, I mean, intuitively one imagines that uh, if prospective parents can choose the, the personalities, the characteristics, the genetic makeup of, of their future children, there is going to be a reduction in diversity, reduction in neurodiversity, physical diversity, that prospective parents will, for the most part, want the same uh, attributes for their future offspring. Um, number of possible responses here, um, but uh, the biggest, I would say, is that the genetic revolution enable us, enables us to cross uh, gaps in the fitness landscape that would otherwise be impossible for natural selection. So in principle, at any rate, it would be possible to have a far greater degree of diversity than anything is feasible today. After all, we, can, uh, we will be able to design new genes, genetic combinations. Um, there is going to be a, a new form of selection pressure. It's not as though uh, evolution and selection pressure is going to be abolished. On the contrary, I reckon uh, selection pressure is going to uh, become even more intense. But the nature of that selection pressure changes when it's no longer natural selection based on uh, mutations and variations that are neutral with respect to the direction of, of selection uh, and uh, yeah, sexual, re uh, sexual reproduction, which is, which is random. And in the new regime, when prospective parents are actually choosing particular alleles, allelic combinations, uh, uh, in anticipation of the likely behavioral and psychological effects. So, okay, I can't rule out the possibility there will be a reduction in diversity, but insofar as there is this reduction, um, let's say, okay, if, if everyone is predisposed to, or very strongly predisposed to enjoy invincible psychological and physical good health, I would say this actually expands the opportunity for everyone to uh, have a, a rich and diverse lifestyle. After all, physical good health, it's enabling. In one sense, of course, if everyone were, uh, were physically healthy, we'd all be the same. But in, a, in another sense, the opportunity to lead uh, diverse lives will be far greater. So we get to choose our own horrors then. Okay. Um, the, the next part is about having multiple occurrences of transhumanism. So like we have now, we have different nations, we're probably going to have different points, different groups, developing along different lines. 
how are we going to keep them from well, going to war with each other? Sorry, could you? Are you sorry, could you uh, uh, clarify a little bit more that you have in mind? Different uh, cultures of 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 transhumans, transhumanists. How can we stop them going to going to war? Uh, sorry, mm. I I think one part of enhancement technology is uh, enhancing our capacity for social cognition, empathetic understanding, kind of naturalized telepathy. If one's conception of intelligence and hence of superintelligence focuses on what one might call uh, autistic intelligence or IQ, then the idea uh, this will seem quite orthogonal to empathy, which is seen as a mere personality variable. But if we look at what actually drove the evolution of distinctively human intelligence, uh, not least as well as our capacity for generative syntax, not least this capacity for mind reading, social cognition, empathetic understanding on its darker side, the Machiavellian ape, i.e. a conception of intelligence that has ecological validity, then in enriching our cognitive capacities is going to enable us to become more socially adept and uh, empathetically understanding than, let's say, a mirror touch synesthete. Uh, you know, mirror, mirror touch synesthetes, if you recall, if you uh, catch your hand in the door, would feel a pain as acutely as you do. Now, that's a very crude example, but generalizing this to cognitive analogues uh, and with the use of, of technology and other forms of enhancement, it will really be possible for us to understand each other, other sentient beings, far more richly than is, than is possible today. So... In that sense, uh, just as two mirror touch synesthetes aren't going to have a fist fight because it would be like hurting oneself, uh, if we have uh, a super intelligent post humans, I think they will uh, they will not be today's quasi uh, sociopaths. And for very good evolu evolutionary reasons, uh, evolution has made us quasi sociopaths, not completely, but nonetheless. Clearly, it's yeah. The the uh, the world seems centered uh, on, on me. It's clearly genetically adaptive for for this to be the case. Me and my relatives, kind of thing. But uh, in principle, uh, technology, uh, artificial uh, 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 intelligence amplification will enable us to overcome the egocentric illusion. Much more. <laughs> okay, cheers. Mm -hmm. So this is not an entirely serious uh, question, but I, I think may, maybe we need some levity here. I, I wonder if you've ever thought of the idea of the alter ego, somebody completely opposite from you. Because I, I have found somebody in my own life, uh, David Crippen at the University of uh, Pittsburgh, as far as he and I can tell, he and I are as opposite as two people can possibly be in almost every way. And I um, would like to suggest that we've encountered in this course somebody who's rather opposite of you. Um, you seem to be enjoying the uh, interaction with our um, students and you have in the past. We have another lecturer who's equally valuable who feels that he the the video of him answering questions with the students can never be seen anywhere on earth this is forbidden and and, so, and that's Marcus uh, Hutter have you ever met him do you do you know anything about him I, yes, I'm actually due to be sharing a platform with him in uh, Melbourne. I don't know whether it's the last day of uh, December or the, fir the first of December. So uh, I haven't decided what precisely I'm going to be talking about. What AC can't do, I thought, would be a uh, uh, one possibility. Um, but no, in one sense, I can understand this because clearly when one is, is talking this interactive debate, there is the possibility for verbal missteps. Uh, yes, one's responses are not going to be clearly thought out. 
inevitably, when one's got this kind of interaction, people are going to be focusing a lot of the time on stuff that's quite irrelevant to one's core message, whether one's tone of voice, accent, mannerisms, stuff like that. And in my my case, be different if I felt my bodily avatar evoked the future paradise that I'm talking about. But though I, though I don't have two heads, uh, equally, I don't feel it does uh, future paradise justice. So uh, I, no, I, I can understand. I don't know precisely uh, uh, Marcus. It's, uh, I, I think uh, it might be profitable when you meet him to just uh, talk with him about it. I, I've... I've accepted that, that he can never be shown on uh, video with any of our students anywhere ever, and that you, you know, enjoy it and it works very well. But I think uh, intellectually it'd be fun for you and him to talk about your <laughs> different views on this. So are there other students who want to come forward? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Hello. Um, my question is about <clears throat> moving or abolishing suffering of animals um, and relating it to urbanization as our population continues and uh, I guess it's growing already um, and urbanization, how cities are beginning to grow and how that will affect like, obviously nature and other animals being pushed out of their habitats and environments. Where do we draw the line between I guess between uh, protecting animals and I guess hurting our, the progression of our species itself, right? Where do you stop something like maybe expanding a city because it's starting to, and on a global scale too, right? Because obviously people are growing all over the place. Like where do you, where do you think um, we should draw the line from your perspective? Or, if, or even if we should draw the line, maybe we should just stop urbanization now and I guess for the sake of preventing the suffering of animals. Uh. I don't think uh, uh, a species uh, has an identity over and above uh, individual members of that species. And so clearly, if you destroy or compromise a particular habitat, uh, then this is not going to be uh, favorable to this notional well-being of the species that some people have. But so long as individuals suffering sentient beings are not harmed, uh, I don't have any particular ethical problems. But in practice, it's most probably going to be the case that the only long, uh, only large terrestrial vertebrates, apart from humans, uh, that are free living uh, by the middle of next century, are probably going to exist only in our wildlife parks. Uh, and yes, we, we, within our li wildlife parks, I think we have a, an obligation to compassion for compassionate stewardship. Um, but in the case of genuine and irreconcilable uh, differences in the interests of, of, of sentient beings, uh, I think the interests of the, of the more sentient being come first. Uh, I would describe myself as an anti-speciesist, but this isn't the case of all sentient beings are equal. If it's a Anopheles mosquito versus a human child or a pig, it's the pig or the, uh, the, the human child that, that, that comes first. Hmm. Thank you. One of the things that I find most uh, remarkable about this interaction that we've had with you many times is that um, on paper, a lot of the views that, that you hold uh, seem surprising and, and uh, illogical, and yet when people come down here and look you in the eye and talk to you, it all begins to sound quite reasonable. And I, I, I wonder really how that works, and if many other things that seem unreasonable in the world, if we could just look in the eye on Skype the person who was the origin of those seemingly unreasonable ideas, we'd come to <laughs> remarkable understanding. How, how do you see it? Do you, do you think, are you in a special area of uh, intellectual inquiry where misunderstanding is more likely to be bridged by face-to-face, -face or, or is this a general phenomenon 
that if we just uh, arrange for more Skype uh, conversations and as, you know, Bono says, bringing people into the same room who have no business being in the same room together, is, is that what would solve most of uh, the problems in the world? Actually, I find this rather alarming because the, the case for phasing out the biology of suffering would be just as powerful and compelling if it were come to light that I were a monster of depravity and hypocrisy who ate babies for breakfast. Uh, that, yeah, it's, it's reassuring that I don't come across as someone who frightened the horses. But yes, one's got to be very, very careful about associating a particular current of ideas with any, any particular person, at least not until they're safely dead. Uh, in that I fear, uh, for instance, Aubrey Gray, hats off to what he's achieved, but he, if he were to keel over tomorrow, God forbid, there would be a lot of uh, knowing uh, 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 comments from people, ah, they'd always known it was, it was nonsense. Um, so, yes, I'm clearly very uh, pleased that these ideas are being discussed, but it, it's a double-edged sword. It, it, it really is. Um, yes. No, I... I can understand that. One, one would hate to feel that it's just your personal magnetism that is keeping these weak ideas alive. <laughs> this is the problem. I do not have, I do not have Kurt Zweilian like uh, uh, charisma. I have the bodily posture of a Delta minus male. I mean, I, when I'm on the net, I can fake being an alpha and punch above my weight, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm operating at the outer edges of my design specifications, so I say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, there must be other students. Yes. Hi. Hi. So I was, uh, just give me a sec, I just got to pull it up here. So it says you're currently leading a campaign for women-only governments within the next 25 years in order to stop war? Right. I think this was a, 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 uh, some comments I once made on Facebook. Hank this year uh, turned them into an, uh, a, an article which were then picked up by a, me a men's organization and that said I was leading a, ca uh, a campaign um as a, yeah just 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 to clarify yes if we had all female uh, uh, uh all female political elite i do not think there would be territorial wars of aggression in, in, in the way there are now but i'm not leading a campaign for it i do not regard this as sociologically realistic so i interrupted you but i was just clarifying okay no that's good you made the clarification but um I, I just wanted to say, like, in terms of human nature, you could say the motives for war, power, resource, prestige, and overall control of the planet. And I think it's fair to say both genders have, um, like, elements of this. You know what I mean? Like, both are motivated in similar regards. And then there are also other women leaders in history, such as Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, that have had male-like qualities, so. Yes, if we were to decide that to avoid global catastrophic and existential risk, it would be prudent to elect an all-female political elite, then this would lead to a sea change in political culture. Uh, Yes, it's true that there have been warrior queens from Boudicca to Margaret Thatcher, but if you actually examine the circumstances in which they gained their reputation, their, their, their reputation, these were defensive uh, contexts from Boudicca, who uh, her daughters were raped, she was flogged by the invading uh, Romans, to uh, Mrs. Thatcher, who when the Argentinian junta invaded the Falklands, Women can be just as, dare one say it, nasty as, as men can, but on the, this is okay, a generalization, but there's a very good uh, 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 grounds for this generalization based on different reproductive strategies and evolutionary history. Women are not predisposed to territorial wars of aggression. 
where is where is men are and one can look back uh uh yes uh, okay it's simplistic to uh, to uh, look at, at chimpanzees and say, well, we're, we're not fundamentally different. But if you look at uh, chimpanzee bands, raiding troops, there aren't any troops of chimpanzees where it is the females who go and out on these raiding raiding parties and, and warlike expeditions. Um, so once again, this is statistical. I, I, I can't guarantee that if it were the case, we made this a decision to elect all female leadership, there would be no war. But equally, in my opinion, it would dramatically reduce the likelihood. It's hard to imagine an all-female political elite wanting to uh, spend a great deal of money on developing nuclear weapon systems, biological warfare, a very, very different approach. Um, so, yes, this... This discussion, as I said, it was, it was, was quite informal because I don't think it, it, think it realistic. But nonetheless, it's in the context, it was in the context of existential, existential risk, global catastrophic risk. And if I told you, for instance, that there was some technical measure that would reduce uh, airplane accidents by 10 percent, it would seem a complete no brainer implementing it. I said that there was a technical measure that would perhaps reduce the likelihood of war, thermonuclear war of the century by perhaps 95%. Would you go for it? Well, perhaps, but if I actually said, well, that would in entail involving, entail electing an all-female political elite, most people would very rapidly uh, uh, back, back paddle, but it, back pedal. But it does seem that uh, testosterone, high testosterone levels clearly are a risk factor in the way that, let's say, uh, alcohol intoxication is a risk factor for uh, driving crudely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there other questions? The, the uh, reaction to the book uh, lean in uh, has been very interesting. You know, it, it, it's a book about empowering women, but it's written by a very wealthy, high-status woman who probably hasn't had a lot of the problems that ordinary women have, but has been pregnant, didn't get any special parking when she was pregnant, and so on. So, it, it you you can look at the book various ways. In, in my own life, I, I got that book for my spouse, and she got very, very angry. So, anyway, I realized what a you know, controversial issue this, this, this empowerment of women is. Mm -hmm. When Geraldine uh, Ferraro was a uh, candidate for uh, President of the United States, I found myself more in favor of her than any woman that I know. So I wonder also how women feel they, they are not entirely I mean it seems odd but I think they're not a hundred percent in favor of these ideas of, of, of having only women uh, making uh, critical decisions about uh, large mm. groups of human beings so like like everything else it's, it's very complex and there are open questions but it interests me in this course we talk a lot about open questions and you know philosophy is mostly about questions that don't have uh, immediate solutions with children as being more and more shown that they learn much better if you present them with open questions that, that they're trying to find their own answers to so in a sense we're sort of doing that in this interaction with you and in the course and general, so I guess we should become co comfortable. What do you think? Are uh, open questions a problem? Should we try to close the loop, or are they uh, a good thing in the world? No, I said as many open questions as possible. Just, just one more note on the, uh, yes, the issue of all, of all women government. I suspect one's response to speculation like this, a, a lot will depend on one's views on feminism in the women's movement. But in the context of the original discussion, this was considering 
purely a technical measure because sadly it's a very grim thought i think it's highly likely thermonuclear weapons are going to be used in warfare this century um in terms of what technical measures can we use it's very old-fashioned threat in one sense i'm not talking exotic threats about super intelligence but yes it seems quite likely that at least part of the world's nuclear arsenal will be used how can we minimize the likelihood of war between nation states this century which in all likelihood if they're medium or large players will be nuclear weapons and that was the yeah the, the technical considering it purely as a technical measure yeah yeah okay well um it it's four minutes before the end of the class period i i want to thank you very very much uh, you've uh, distinguished yourself you know in the beginning there were four or five people we were doing skype uh conversations with and uh, really the ones with you have been much more satisfactory and I think more comfortable for you than, than, than the uh, Skypes we were having with other people. So I think that's something to be proud of. I'm not sure how it happened or what there is about you that, that led to this happy situation. Well, I I don't bite, even though I have clearly, yes, some quite controversial views on a number of topics. Yeah, I could, I could be completely mistaken. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, well, we look forward to the similar session uh, next term, and thank you very much for today. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say a few housekeeping things. You can listen if you want. <laughs> Uh, thank you very, very much. I formally bid you uh, f farewell, Kim, and f farewell to your uh, students. Thank you very much. Thank you for some very thoughtful questions. Sorry I didn't do them justice. There's clearly much, much more to be said. You did great. <laughs> so we're <laughs> clapping now. <laughs> okay, great. So with, with regard to the first written assignment, I, I will have uh, email feedback to e each of you on next uh, Tuesday, so that's the plan for that. It's uh, the least important assignment, uh, least important component of the, of the grade, so there's not a lot really uh, hanging on this. But we, we wanted to, to have some taste of, of, of how you're doing in the course and not leave absolutely everything to the end. My reaction thus far to your papers, I, I, I must say I'm quite impressed with the papers in uh, general. Um, and uh, I've gained some insights, as I always do from student papers in this course, so it's, it's not uh, uni uh, directional learning, I, I learn a lot from you. Um, the one thing that I would say is this idea of medicine writ large, medicine as something broader than you ever thought of before, you need to keep that in, in mind. The moment that you think that every lecturer is required to talk specifically about medicine and you know diseases and uh, therapies, and you've sort of gotten what I'm trying to do in this course wrong, that I'm, I'm thinking of the course much more broadly than that. And you will encounter many lectures in this course that don't talk about a single drug or a single specific disease at all, and it still fits within my concept of the course. So maybe that's the one thing that I would say, that some of you sort of thought that you identified a sort of gotcha moment where one of the le lecturers had failed to consider <laughs> that they need to talk specifically about medicine. And that's not the case. They don't need to do that because we're, we're thinking of medicine very much broader where AI and nanotech fits within that. You, you don't have to apply it to specific uh, diseases and uh, Therapies. Otherwise, I, I, I've been very impressed by the papers, and as I say, I'll have specific uh, feed, feedback for you by email on Tuesday. And you can uh, hang around, but the videography ends now. So anyway, that's, that's the deal. Thanks. <laughs>